Okay, so welcome everyone to our fourth and final day of Engineers Canada's multi-day 30 by 30 virtual conference. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am a visitor on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples. I know that we all are coming from different locations spread across the country today, and it is important that we recognize the first peoples of all these lands. I invite you to enter your own land acknowledgement into the chat today at some point. If you can't do that, that'd be great so that we can collectively recognize the traditional territories of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations peoples that have lived here for millennia. I also give thanks to the elders and traditional knowledge keepers who guide their own communities as well as non-Indigenous peoples on connecting with the lands we're on today. A few pieces of housekeeping before we begin. Today's panelists will be speaking in English. However, there is simultaneous interpretation available in French and the instructions for how to access the interpretation are currently shown on your screen. Closed captioning in English is also available today and can be accessed using the live transcript or CC button on your Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen. If you have any technical problems, message Andrew Hunt in the chat. He is our technician, has been doing a great job with us. Um, if he can make, um, and, and, and he can answer any of your technical uh, problems that you have. Um, if you have any questions for the speakers and panelists today, we invite you to enter them into the chat and we'll be keeping track of all the questions um, and bring them all together for the end of the session for the Q&A portion. During the panel discussion, we ask that everyone keep their microphones and their cameras off. Um, we are recording the session today, and so we're really excited to post it if anybody misses it, um, along with all four of our sessions from this month on our conference website. Of course, we're all here to learn, and we expect everyone to maintain an open mind and be respectful of your comments and behaviors to the speakers and other attendees. Please be mindful of how your words might impact others. We will not accept any toxic, discriminatory, or demeaning comments, and we'll be monitoring the chats throughout the session. Now I'd like to pass the mic on to our Chief Executive Officer, Gerard McDonald, to start us off today. Thanks very much, Cassandra. I'd like to welcome you all today to the fourth and final day of this year's 30 by 30 virtual conference. We've had open and honest conversations this month about our collective efforts to make engineering more equitable, diverse, and inclusive. The successes that we've encountered and the challenges that still need to be overcome. And this month in particular is a particular is a fitting time to bring attention to these important topics. June is Indigenous History Month, as well as Pride Month. And today is International Women in Engineering Day. So there is ample opportunity this month to celebrate the contributions that Indigenous people, members of the LGBTQ2 plus community and women bring to engineering and to underscore the importance of working towards bringing more of these diverse voices to the profession. Engineers Canada and the engineering profession's 30 by 30 goal has always been to bring more of these underrepresented voices into the profession. And to do that, 30 by 30 brings together a diverse range of stakeholders from across the engineering sector to the table. Today, as we celebrate International Women in Engineering Day, we have put together a dynamic dialogue event. We will hear from a group of diverse female identified young leaders in engineering as they share their vision for the future of engineering, as well as senior leaders who will speak about how they are responding and advocating for culture change and what types of tactics they are currently using to work towards working in the workplace. Now, I would like to pass the mic to our Vice President, Corporate Affairs and Strategic Partnerships, Jeanette Southwood. Over to you, Jeanette. Thank you, Gerard, and hello, everyone. I'm very happy to introduce Vanessa Raquel Raponi. Vanessa is the founder of Enchiqueers Canada, a national nonprofit that advocates for intersectional queer inclusion in the engineering profession. Representing Enchiqueers has brought Vanessa from coast to coast to present on panels, sessions, and talks as an expert in equity, diversity, and inclusion. She has also taken that energy online by launching a video blog on life, stories, and advice from the perspective of a queer woman of color. You can find that video blog on YouTube at Vanessa Raquel Raponi. Vanessa currently works as a product development engineer in training at Spinmaster, 
a Canadian-founded international toy company that created such brands as Paw Patrol and Hatchimals, meaning she designs and creates toys for a living. Sounds like a great job. In addition, Vanessa is a previous recipient of Engineers Canada's Gold Medal Student Award. I've had the pleasure of working and getting to know Vanessa over the past four years, and I must say her passion is contagious. You'll see that too if you haven't already met her during this next session. Vanessa, thank you so much for guiding our discussion today. Over to you. Thank you so much, Jeanette. That was a very sweet introduction. I've been very fortunate to know Jeanette for a while now and uh, am grateful to be here for Engineers Canada today in this great presentation. I think this is actually going to be a really unique conversation because we're not only going to have uh, one group of perspectives, but two, and then also having them intersect with each other. So I think that this is going to be really exciting and uh, it might be a bit longer of a panel, but I think that will just allow for a deeper conversation. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce to you our three phenomenal um, young leaders. I'm going to give them the opportunity to deep dive into their uh, their own introductions. But first up, we do have Naomi Sayabobo. Uh, sorry, Abomo. She is a third year civil engineering student at the University of Waterloo, and she is the current president of the National Society of Black Engineers on her campus. Next, we have Jasmine McDermott, who is coming to us from the University of Calgary, and she is the president of the Calgary Indigenous STEAM Students Association, or CISA. And lastly, we have Wendy Vasquez, who is a graduate in computer engineering from Université de Sherbrooke, and she is a former president of the Canadian Federation of Engineering Students, or the CFES. So thank you three so much for being here today. I hope you're all in a great mood and I will pass it off to each of you to do your own more thorough introductions and to answer the question, not only just tell us a little bit about yourself, but what inspired you to take on leadership roles in the engineering space? So why don't we start with Jasmine, then we'll do Naomi and Wendy. Sure, hey, so thanks everyone for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, my name is Jasmine. I'm going into my capstone year of mechanical engineering at the University of Calgary. And from when I first started at school, right away, I was involved with our local engineering student society. I was a first year rep, and then I was vice president academic and then um, diversity commissioner. And through that, I got to go to a whole bunch of conferences around Canada, um, hear some really cool conversations and be inspired. And one conversation I heard was a diversity panel where someone had asked a question about um, indigenous people in engineering. And I remember it clearly because it was super awkward because nobody knew um, what to say. And I remember sitting in the quiet room being like, oh my God, this is me, I'm indigenous. Um, my grandfather's from Saw Ridge Cree First Nation in Northern Alberta. And I was a first year engineering student. And that was the first time for me that I really had kind of like some insight into what, what I could learn more about and how I could make what I liked in school be, relative, be relevant to the rest of my life and the world around me. So I came back home and I, made plans to go to a bunch of um, Indigenous conferences, hear from the Assembly of First Nations, um, traveled around and really just started listening and learning. Um, and what I took away from those conversations um, was that when I would be at an Indigenous STEM conference or event, I felt like I really belonged both as an Indigenous person and as an engineer at the same time. And that was an amazing feeling. And I felt like when I came back to my own homeschool, um, I fit in as an engineering student in engineering and I felt and I fit in as an indigenous student at our native center, um, but maybe not as an indigenous student in engineering or as an engineer in the native center, just because those worlds felt so far apart. Um, so in an effort to try and bring those together, me and some friends founded an uh, organization. It's a student club called the Calgary Indigenous STEAM Students Association. And um, through that, we've just been working to create um, better spaces for Indigenous students who are in STEM and STEAM. And um, yeah, it's been an awesome, awesome journey so far. That's amazing. I'm so glad you were able to take your own passion and your own identity and 
turn that into something. I can definitely relate to that. And Jaquiris had a similar, similar start. So that's amazing. All right, next up, Naomi, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Naomi Say. I'm going into my third year of civil engineering in the fall. Um, I've always been a very active member of my community, um, whether it be through high school or in elementary school as well. Um, I was a student body president, and I also created a club for Black students um, in my high school uh, just to celebrate the culture and um, empower us and encourage us. Um, and then once I got to university, uh, I also wanted to do the same. Uh, there was already some existing Black student associations, um, and I was participating in some of them. But then uh, the engineering uh, department is always a little bit more isolated. So we have our own specific uh, concerns and our own specific um, interests and things that we um, encounter. Um, and so during one of my first weeks in uh, engineering, there was another upper year Black engineering student that had spoke to me and she was very encouraging and just let me know that if I ever needed anything that I could always reach out to her. And I definitely did reach out to her because definitely needed um, support along uh, my journey. Um, and within a year or so, she asked me to join um, to begin and found our National Society of Black Engineers at the University of Waterloo. So through that, I grew um, within my roles. I was a social events lead. Um, and then pretty early into the beginning of our uh, chapter, she had to leave due to personal circumstances. So I stepped in as a role as a vice president. Um, and since then, um, I've been vice president and now current president. And just really my biggest um, inspiration and the biggest thing that I always want to do when I'm involved in these uh, kinds of activities is giving back to the students um, and giving, hoping that what I can do can impact and give a better experience for the next student. So a lot of times, like within at least my cohorts and the engineering uh, department uh, within the University of Waterloo, uh, we're very, very, very uh, small minority of Black engineering students. Um, and so being able to have a space where we can collectively share our experiences of being the one or two, three Black engineering students within the classroom um, and being able to support each other and affirm each other and give each other whatever kind of encouragement we can do um, is what motivates me. And um, being able to see that change um, in real time has been uh, very rewarding. Um, our first years this year didn't have to go into the school year not knowing where they could find resources. Um, a lot of them are part of our team now and I can see the growth. I can see um, how they can also find their own leadership roles within this type of community. Um, and then as well as they uh, continue to share these types of experiences and we continue to have these conversations, we can bring forth um, our concerns to the dean or to the faculty. So I've been a part of a lot of conversations like that where I'm able to uh, give a summary of what I've experienced, but also what other students have told me because of, there's not exactly a written list of these types of things. It just happens a little bit in the background and it won't be addressed unless somebody brings it forth and um, there's also others that are willing to listen and start to create the change um, about these issues. So that's a lot of what I do. And then I also am a part of a couple of task force that uh, have the same uh, goals of trying to address the issues of marginalized students within the university and beyond. Um, and so I'm really excited to have this kind of conversation as well so that we can all um, collectively continue to create these changes and make uh, more inclusive and safe spaces for everybody um, within engineering. Well, thank you so much, Naomi. That was a very inspiring story. And I really appreciate how you mentioned making uh, experiences easier for those following in your footsteps. I think that's so fundamental to the real essence of what EDI work comes down to. And Wendy, last but not least, let's hear about you. What, what inspired you to take on a leadership role and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so thank you, Vanessa. I'm really happy to be with all of you today. Um, so I just graduated from computer engineering at University of Sherbrooke, and I was involved in different student organizations for the past four years now. So I first started at the Quebec Confederation for Engineering Students Outreach. And the reason why, like what inspired me at first was the fact that uh, th that organization was working on student mental health. And I thought it was really important to me because it's something that I related to personally, but I could also see the struggle that my peers were, were also facing. So that's what attracted me at first. And then I continued in that organization as president 
and then I made the jump to the Canadian Federation of Engineering Students, which is the national student organization. And I, I still continue my work on student mental health, but also on different issues. And for example, on the importance of modernizing the engineering curriculum to ensure that our profession is responding to the current needs of, of society. And also that we're able to attract a diverse pool of students because depending on how you frame a problem, then it's gonna have a different impact on, on who is attracted to the profession as well. So that's something uh, that I've been working on as the VP academic of the CFES. And then last year I was president of the CFES. And it, well, it was quite a challenging year, I think for everyone because of COVID. So we had to, to really be <laughs> more um, flexible and really learn how to deal with doing uh, events, not in person, but it was very, it, it was still a good year for the organization and we worked on sustainability and engineering and how it is important for us to take into consideration our impact as engineers, like what we do has an impact on the society, on the communities that are gonna use our product or the different um, users. So, so that's what I've been working on. And what really inspired me ultimately, I think, was the ability to uh, advocate on behalf of students and really work on issues that are important to students and be able to work with Engineers Canada, for example, or with the Canadian Engineering Accreditation Board and the deans and really voice those issues and really come together uh, as a group of students and make sure that our voices are being heard at the different levels. Yeah, it's so important to have the student voice at the CEAB level and with the Dean's Council. Um, and I'm, I'm really grateful that you were able to get so engaged in this space. And uh, all three of you, it's, it's been truly so, some powerhouse people the Engineers Canada team was able to find for this panel. I'm really excited to hear about all your thoughts. So thank you so much for all of your intros. So now let's dive into a true essence of why we're here today. So we are here speaking to you as young leaders in engineering on International Women in Engineering Day, a day when we celebrate and recognize the work that women in engineering do all around the world. We also know that women continue to be underrepresented along with black, indigenous, people of color, LGBTQ peoples and people with disabilities. What is your vision for the future of engineering and what do you think is currently working? Let's go Naomi, Wendy, Jasmine for this order. Naomi, what do you think? Sure. One of my biggest visions is that uh, as students and within the professional um, environment, we can show up um, as ourselves uh, within mm -hmm. the engineering space. I think it's definitely great to have um, representation and encourage people to come more into engineering or STEM, um, but we also have to breathe uh, a safe environment for them to feel like they can do so. I know a lot of the story that has been for me is that um, you, there is a picture and an idea of what an engineer looks like, um, but sometimes many of us, I think a lot of us, us on this panel right now, don't exactly fit the mold of what um, immediately comes to mind. Um, and I think it's really unfortunate that because of this reason, sometimes we're made to feel like we're undeserving or that we have to work a lot harder um, to stay within it. Um, so I would definitely would want to see that uh, we are able to embrace uh, different backgrounds, different uh, gender identities, uh, anybody that would like to be in this space that they can really be empowered and encouraged. Um, I know that for me, um, I was, uh, my dad is an electrical engineer. Um, I always had really great uh, professors and teachers um, within uh, uh, prior to post-secondary uh, that were always very um, helpful and um, encouraged me to stay within science um, and math, uh, but that's not the case for every student. And especially uh, there is a, a disproportionate amount of, uh, for example, uh, black students that don't have that experience where they have people directly encouraging and pouring into them uh, so that they stay within the, uh, the STEM environment. Um, and same with women as well. Uh, there's so many um, statistics that show how within the first years of high school, that's when whether or not you can see if a girl is going to stay within uh, science and math. And if they can't stay within there, then later on, they won't uh, go into engineering or any of this, these types of disciplines. So I think that's uh, something that I would really want to have change and a lot more um, investment. I know there's a lot of universities that 
already do some outreach programs, um, but just uh, diversifying them and really, really continuing to pour um, all the funding and support and even groups like all the groups that we're involved in, um, investing in them, donating to them, supporting them uh, so that we can continue to do the work to um, really create these types of environments where students feel that they can not only um, uh, thrive, uh, not only be in this environment, but they can actually thrive and fully go through with all of their dreams. Um, and I know that uh, on a more positive space, uh, look, outlook, there is uh, some good work that is happening, especially um, recently, there's been a lot more push to have uh, these kinds of conversations um, and willingness to have uh, truth telling and um, openness to listening to what these experiences have really looked like. Uh, but I think just long term, it has to be a committed investment um, and that we can really see the full uh, uh, change uh, within uh, the engineering discipline. Yeah, I love that. I think the, the essence of once upon a time, we used to only talk in this space about diversity in engineering. And then we recognize that need for inclusion of once you have the diversity, you need to make sure that they're actually accepted and welcomed in, in these environments. So uh, great, uh, totally agree with everything you shared. Wendy, what about you? What are your thoughts? Yeah, for the future of engineering, I think, like I mentioned in my introduction, it's important to have a more holistic approach to problems to really, so that people really understand what is our impact as engineers, that we're not just working on the technical aspect of things, but what we are creating has societal impact, environmental impact. So that's going to, attract more people that like that's what studies have shown so if we're able to reframe the problems that we're tackling and showing like hey we as engineers we're working on these really complex societal problems then there's going to be a more diverse group of people interested in what we're doing so I think that's super important to reframe the problems that we are doing not only when we are on the market like when we're professional engineers but also before that throughout your engineering curriculum so that way students also feel encouraged and feel uh, like stimulated by what they're learning as well and saying, oh, okay, if I'm able to solve this problem, then I'm gonna be able to apply that in a more complex one. So seeing how, like, what is our impact as engineers, it's gonna make a difference. Cause like Naomi mentioned, sometimes we have like this idea of what an engineering looks like. And for example, computer engineering, it does not look like me at all. It's like someone hacking behind a computer wearing a hoodie or whatever, <laughs> but <laughs> so it's important to create this other narrative and saying like, hey, computer engineers also are working on technology that is helping the medical field. We're like it, we're able to save lives. We're able to communicate through these platforms because of computer engineers. So if we're able to really shine the light on that, it's going to be more interesting for a diverse group of people. And something else that Naomi touched on is the fact that we need uh, like to be to continue promoting the profession uh, in elementary schools in high schools as well and showing like what we do as engineers the different paths that an engineer can take because there's not just one linear path you can do different things in engineering and really showing what these paths are and having role models role models is so so important um studies have shown that like women in general who are in engineering is because they had a role model in their life for example it was my dad in my case. So to me, it felt really realistic to become an engineer. Like I didn't really know what I wanted. I know I like science and I was like, oh, makes sense. I can do that. My dad is an engineer as well. So not everyone has the same chance that I do. So it's important to, to really put others like role models for, for young women, but also for other underrepresented groups to see themselves in the profession and see like, oh, if that person can do it, I can do it as well. 100%. I love that reframing concept because say you take the classic example of a civil engineer making a bridge. What about, you know, where that bridge is being placed? What, who, what communities that bridge is impacting? How that's going to change the space? Like that reframing piece of the same problem and same, same solution is so important. Thank you, Wendy. And Jasmine, what about you? What are your thoughts? Well, what really gives me a lot of hope for the future of engineering <clears throat> is that I, we're talking about these issues, that we're having these conversations. And I think that makes me so happy. And it really speaks to just what an exciting time it is to be an engineering, to be a minority in engineering, even though there are still challenges 
um, like for me as an Indigenous person to see that people are starting to ask questions about Canadian history, are interested in learning more, and are thinking about their co-workers in that sense and how their um, work impacts um, First Nations in Canada is really encouraging to me. And I think we just need to keep going with that, keep asking those questions and carrying those conversations forward. And I think if I could have an, an ideal vision for the future, um, something that I always see is we have two two worldviews and two approaches to life and to engineering. We have an Indigenous framework and a Western framework where the Western framework is very written, it's very hierarchical, and the Indigenous framework is more oral tradition and it's more relational style thinking. And within both these frameworks, we have really awesome science, really cool engineering, and a lot of value and knowledge to be brought to the table. And um, what we've seen throughout the history of colonialism is where we have um, these struggles is where one system is tried to fit into another and then there's this conflict. So what I would really hope is that we can have um, Indigenous approaches to engineering and Western approaches to engineering, um, both respected in their own ways and allowed to exist as, um, you know, these wonderful parallel systems um, that don't necessarily need to fit into each other, but can complement each other. I love that. Yeah. And I think that there's constantly more and more interest in engaging in Indigenous history and especially with everything that's happened in the news recently. I'm sure we all know what I'm talking about. There has been another wave of, of even more interest and commitment. And I do think that it's so important to integrate these uh, different methods of thinking into the profession for sure. And I would love to see more workplaces trying to integrate them even more explicitly into the work that they do. So thank you for sharing that, Jasmine. All right, and uh, the last question that we have for our young leaders before we pivot to the senior leaders is surrounding what types of changes might be required. So how do you think the profession needs to change in order to make it more inclusive? So we'll start with Wendy, then Jasmine, then Naomi. So we definitely need to create a space that is safe for everyone and where they feel respected by their colleagues as well. And there are different ways to do that. And there's also different ways to attract a diverse group of people. For example, when you're a company, uh, when you're doing your recruiting process, there are ways to remove unconscious biases. For example, you can remove their name from their resume. You can remove any identifying pronouns. So that way you don't think about anything else but what their experience and their skills and you're not judging them on anything else so that's that's one way for example to remove uh, biases also when you are in your workplace it's important to have clear guidelines and processes in place if any incident happens at work if a colleague is being having an inappropriate behavior with someone else like that person needs to know who they can talk to so that way like they know they can talk to someone and there's consequences to to actions that aren't respectful of other people that's really important as well to create that safe environment and providing training to employees and also to managers because you know EDI is relatively like a new concept you know and people are willing to learn are willing to to be uh, to create those inclusive spaces but if they don't know how to react to some to some incidents and it might be hard for them and they might not do the right action at the time. So it's important to empower also the people that are part of your, your team. And yeah, it's important It's important to also encourage that diverse group of people to, to, um, to apply to promotions, for example, because it is known that women have a tendency, oh, I'm hearing someone else, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, um, what I was saying is that it's also important to encourage people to apply to different positions. For example, like a woman has a tendency to feel less confident to apply to the same job, even if she has the same ability as uh, her male counterpart, because it's like internalized biases. And if we're able to, you know, encourage them and give them that push that will make them apply to that job, then you're also recruiting a you're also uh, putting the effort to recruit a diverse group of people. So it's really 
creating that space for them and encourage them to be there and making sure that where, when they are in that space, they're being respected by their colleagues. A hundred percent. That respect is so important. And the application process is, is a great point to bring up because if they're not even in the room applying, how, how can they be considered for, for these different roles to progress? So great point. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, Jasmine, what do you think? How, uh, how can we, um, what does the profession need to change to become more inclusive? Yeah, so I guess sort of similar to what I said earlier, continuing to have this dialogue and openness um, and realizing the reality is you won't always have um, an Indigenous person in the room just based off of how underrepresented we are, um, but that doesn't mean that your work isn't impacting Indigenous communities. So um, sometimes when I go on an internship and I'm speaking about different Indigenous issues with my team, um, usually the reaction is, wow, we have like never thought of this, we haven't heard about this, this is so, this is so new or this is so unique. And um, I'm always a little surprised by that because to me it's not, I, I think I'm saying very simple, simple things. So I think what's really important is um, to have our non-Indigenous allies um, step forward and bring these conversations to the table. Um, Firstly, because there won't always be an Indigenous person there to bring it up, but also that it's not um, the responsibility of Indigenous people to always mm -hmm. be the one to educate about um, Canadian history. Just like um, it's a very heavy burden to bear and the responsibility of decolonization um, does, doesn't fall to Indigenous people. So as much as it's so awesome uh, when people are able and willing to share and that's just such a such a gift. Um, we also really need our non-Indigenous allies to um, bring these conversations up, whether it's a values moment or a safety moment or even just a land acknowledgement or an informal conversation um, with your coworkers or with your friends. Um, just to kind of start the conversation, everyone can take the time to learn a bit, to read a bit. There's um, so many awesome resources out there written by Indigenous people um, that are widely available. And um, I, I think if we can all kind of take that responsibility on ourselves, I know even for me, I'm still learning. I still have so much to learn. We all do. Um, but as we all go forward together with that, I think it makes it makes a really big difference. And then that translates into things like recognizing harmful behaviors or um, disrespectful language that people might not even realize or might realize. And um, the more you know and the more you've learned, you'll be in a better place to kind of um, speak up and make a difference when when the time comes. 100%. Yeah, I think that the goal of just removing the emotional labor off of any marginalized community and putting the onus on the other individuals, I think is so important. And I do think it's, it's so insightful to just recognizing the people who aren't in the room are still being impacted point blank, even if they're not there. Um, and that's, that's definitely something our profession could work on for sure. Naomi, what about you? Last thoughts on uh, how the profession needs to change to become more inclusive. Definitely. So I would circle back on what Wendy had said a little bit earlier about education and making sure that it's holistic. Uh, there's so many examples of when, like, for example, there'll be like a uh, dispenser for hand sanitizer that won't work on people that have darker skin, or there's um, um, algorithms like on social media that flag certain type of content and don't flag other kinds of content. All of this comes back down to what is even considered in making something efficient or admissible uh, to the public. Um, and if it's something that uh, where, for example, darker skinned people don't have to be considered for you to release a new technology, that's already a very fundamental problem in how we are allowing the progression um, of the new uh, creations that are coming out of engineering. Um, and so I think that definitely comes back to um, education at the earliest level. Um, if we can add uh, more uh, uh, information when we're in our university about how this will impact us in the future um, and what types of uh, people that we are um, actually creating um, our technologies for and making everything uh, for, that's a very, very important thing that I think would help in later on actually having uh, um, in, uh, like new technology that is inclusive to everybody. 
Um, and at the same time, going back to representation. So if there's uh, more professors that are black or of color, if there's more people in leadership that are also of color and um, represent a diverse amount of people, more people can see themselves within uh, this envir uh, environment and this space and are more likely to stay within it. Uh, we don't want to have people coming into engineering, but then feeling like they need to leave parts of themselves out of it um, to stay within it. And that's really the uh, true case um, in a lot of instances and reason why you can see, um, even as we have like our 30 by 30 goal, there's lots of women that go into engineering, but then do they stay later on within their career um, in engineering? And we want to bridge that gap and by addressing some of these issues and by uh, creating more spaces for people to have mentors and feel empowered throughout the entirety of their journey, uh, I think it will create a lot more inclusive space. Yes, I love that. This is uh, some great examples you brought up of, of, as someone mentioned in the comments, just racism in the design process. It's staggering some of these things that exist. Well, I think that uh, the three of you have given us a lot to think about. I think in general, when I think about our profession, um, a lot of old school mentalities come to mind. And I think one such mentality is just the simple fact that if you've been in a position for a long period of time or you are of a certain age that you are innately wiser and know better and, and have the experience. But I think the reality of today's day and age is that that's, there's of course validity to that, but it's equally not always the case. And that we need to look at today's youth and whether it's young professionals or even the next generation coming in and recognize that it's no longer just the status quo is going to be able to be sufficient and what's always worked will continue to work. It's needing to keep up with, with current trends, current changes, societal changes, and recognize that the types of issues we've talked about there, we're here for a 30 by 30 day, but there's so much more complex for all of us as women to or to impact with our race or our sexual identity or our heritage. Like it's it's so much more complex than that. So it's no longer sufficient to just say we care about women. We need to move much, much further in the style. Well, thank you so much to the three of you. I uh, will now transition to the senior leader part of the presentation, and then we'll bring you all back so we can all talk together. So to, uh, to introduce the next series of panelists, we have a really great batch of another three fantastic people. First up, we have Catherine. Uh, who has been in the profession for a while, cares a lot about it. She was actually president of Engineers Canada when the 30 by 30 initiative started, which is incredible. Oh, yes. It's uh, Pelly, Shane, and Joanna, not Catherine. Oh, my apologies. Thank you so much. Um, so Pelly, actually, well, regardless, you should look up Catherine. She's a wonderful person. <laughs> um, so Joanna, or okay, we'll start with Pelly. Pelly is here. So Pelly leads our HR team at Morrison Hirschfield and sits on the executive team. Um, he talks a lot at, at, within his colleagues about gender and the structural change challenges that exist in the community and just about EDI overall. So we're really grateful to have Pelly here with us. Next, we also have Shane, who in fact chairs our 30 by 30 provincial board in Manitoba, working at Manitoba Hydro starting in 1991, currently vice president of operations and corporate chief engineer. Very excited to have Shane. And lastly, Joanna is the president and CEO and founder of WIRE, which is the Women in Renewable Energy Initiative. Uh, so uh, similar to before, I gave a brief intro, even of someone who's not even here, we're introducing everyone, it's great. <laughs> um, and we will uh, then give you now an opportunity to tell us a little bit more about yourselves and specifically, what is the work that you are doing to advance equity, diversity and inclusion within your various spaces? So we'll start with you, Joanna, and then we'll move on to Shane and Pelly. Fantastic. Well, thanks a lot to, to everyone uh, participating this morning or this afternoon, sorry. It's really nice to be here. I am the President CEO of WIRE, Women in Renewable Energy, which is a national and international organization. So I'm very proud to be leading this. We have amazing programs here on the Canadian market, as well as in different regions, uh, in the MENA regions as well. We are now launching Wire Africa and Wire Italy next. So I'm very, very excited. Along with the hard work and passion that I have towards uh, 
what we're doing here at Wire. I also have a full-time job. I work for AVB. So I'm a very busy person, as all of you are on this uh, panel. But uh, I simply choose to work seven days a week because among being with ABB and WIRE, you know, there's always, a, of course, a balance. However, I definitely have a very supportive uh, champion at home who's my husband. So with his tremendous effort and support, you know, I'm able to continue this uh, fantastic journey. Uh, my apologies. And I think that, uh, you know, the amazing work that we are doing here at uh, WIRE is really the great leadership team that we have. So we have a fantastic board of directors that's extremely diverse. We have an amazing advisory committee. Uh, we have a lot of programs that include not only awards, we do conferences and upcoming conference that we're doing is on Hydrogen Business Council. We provide field trips because most people don't know what the difference is between a transmission line versus a distribution line. Due to COVID, we had to move uh, our field trips onto the virtual websites. Uh, we actually recently had a virtual field trip at a London biogas facility, which is absolutely fascinating. We do speed mentoring, speed interviewing with profile. We provide blogs and profiles of women, men and all. Uh, we do, of course, our networking events are now, of course, on the webinar basis. Uh, we provide workshops. Actually, one of our workshops that's upcoming is on financial literacy and the energy sector. So that's uh, another great program. We work with Indigenous communities. And of course, we started WIRE student chapters. So right now, WIRE, like I said, is from in each single province, as well as the territories. And we have WIRE MENA. So we are in WIRE UAE, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Jordan and Turkey, and as stated, I am now going to be working in Italy as well as Africa. So with the help and support of everyone um, at WIRE's family, you know, we are continuously moving the dial. I'm very, very proud of our sponsors. I'm extremely overjoyed with our partners. Um, I partner with different NGOs that really align with our mission. And our mission is very simple. It's to advance the role and recognition of women in the energy sector. Um, being in the energy sector for 18 years, uh, for 10 years, I built wind energy projects, a 35 megawatt wind farm here in Dippy, Nova Scotia, and in 2008, the world's largest wind farm in the world in Roscoe, Texas, 783.4 megawatts. Um, this is no longer the largest wind farm. However, this was the first one. I moved on to PNC and state assistance, and I'm currently working, like I said, for ABB. We at WIRE are here to support and assist. I'm very proud to be here. I'm proud to deliver my message and thank you for having me. Wonderful, well, thank you so much, Joanna. Your organization sounds phenomenal and I'm so glad to hear how global it has become. Um, I, I know that that must have been no small feat on your end. So congratulations for all your hard work there. Shane, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing in the world of advancing equity, diversity and inclusion. Uh, thank you, Vanessa, and good day to everyone. I uh, work at Manitoba Hydro, as Vanessa said. We are the largest employer of engineers in Manitoba. I'm currently in Winnipeg and would like to acknowledge that I'm in the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Denny people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. And um, being a large employer, we have the opportunity to obviously engage in lots of different areas. And personally, I've been active in the engineering community over the last three decades or more, quickly aging myself. And uh, I'm uh, fortunate to sit on our provincial 30 by 30 steering committee led by uh, engineers, geoscientists, Manitoba. I'm also on the industry coalition, which brings different participating employers together on the common cause to look and see what we can do differently moving forward. And I also am one of the founding members of the Friends of Engineering here in Manitoba, which is a group of industry that works closely with the Price Faculty of Engineering on a multitude of opportunities. Um, so within that space uh, and understanding the challenges we have and the opportunities in front of us, um, within Manitoba Hydro, we created a, a task force and I'm the senior leader on it, to which we looked and spoke to uh, our staff to understand what are, what are some of the current barriers, what are some of the current opportunities and challenges with respect to equity and diversity, and how do we increase uh, those different areas within our, uh, in our corporation. So we, we listen to our staff, we try to understand and uh, look at what are some of these pieces that potentially uh, could be improved upon. Uh, currently, we're, we're working on some pieces around parental leaves, uh, return ships, and uh, I'm also uh, 
participating in reverse mentorship with some of our uh, our different younger uh, leaders, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, also um, trying to learn more about how to be an effective ally for those in the different communities. So um, though I'm active and participating, I would suggest I am uh, still in a learning and uh, challenging mode to those who might not be as open to understanding where we are today and where we need to go. Because essentially, I work from the principle that uh, engineering, the, the path I chose, which I believe uh, is here to help improve society as a whole, will we'll only do a true job if it's represented by those who actually are in society and the problems we solve will have that much better solutions if we have equal representation. So I really appreciate the opportunity to participate and uh, would suggest after listening to the young leaders, uh, the future is in good hands. <laughs> I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, something you mentioned that someone else in the chat picked up as well. Could you just quickly define what you mean by reverse mentorship? I think I have an idea of what that is, but sounds sure. Like and and uh, I, I guess I'll try try my best. So essentially, uh, just in internally and maybe in industry at large, I've been able to act as a coach or a mentor for different people over the years. Uh, but this concept someone raised uh, to which. Um, I would engage uh, in my role as a senior leader with those in more junior roles from different uh, parts uh, of the company, from different diversities, to which really it's me listening to them and mm. them helping to teach me what current state is or isn't to help promote, understand, or remove barriers, but to really probably help remove unconscious or implicit bias that I or colleagues may have. And then I can take that and echo it uh, internally or because of my network and connections through other organizations within Manitoba and at large, I can challenge my colleagues uh, with real information from people who really understand it. What a brilliant idea. I definitely uh, need to steal that and share it far and wide. That's a great one. Well, thank you, Shane, for your introduction and your comments. That was greatly appreciated. And Pelly, now I'll pass it over to you. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and what work you're doing to advance equity, diversity, and inclusion. Hi, Vanessa, and um, thanks for the dual introduction because I, I certainly had, um, for those of you who know Catherine, who's co-worker, we've had long and frequent conversations about this whole topic. So I sort of feel like I'm here with at least one head, um, which is my own and my own experience, but, but also uh, working with Catherine, I, I think I'm hoping to represent her as well. Um, as you probably know, Morrison Hirschfield is a, is a diversified employee-owned consulting engineering firm with 23 offices in Canada and the U.S. And um, over the years, I've worked as a senior manager in a number of business sectors, but mo most recently professional services for IT and engineering. And uh, my, my focus really has been on people, leadership, change, and organizational effectiveness. And I I think that a lot of the, a lot of what we're discussing today fits nicely into that. Um, keep in mind, as I'm, I'm participating here today, it's it's always odd when you're kind of categorized, and I know I'm being categorized a little bit as part of the problem, as as being of an age group, of being, um, you know, tr traditional in a sense. Um, but I assure you that as I participate in these discussions I'm really here to learn. And, uh, and I do think in, in, in many ways, uh, I love this notion of reverse mentorship because uh, there are some things that I think would surprise you about my experience historically over the years. I think you'd be surprised to know when I was in university, how radical the, the thinking was. And I think you'd be surprised how much progress has been made in the last 40 years. On the other hand, one of the things I'm quick to tell my daughters is don't take any of this for granted. It's got to be, it's got to be maintained and um, continue to pursue the support of these uh, hard won battles. Um, keep in mind as well that I'm really speaking from my experience rather than the firm I work for. <clears throat> I'm actually not an engineer and I do see things a bit differently. Um, and uh, really the question asked of me today is, is what are we doing to advance diversity, inclusion, and equity? And uh, keep, it, keep in mind, I, I would argue it's early days that we're, to quote somebody, um, we're at the end of the beginning and still early in the progress. 
Um, I don't I don't feel like we're um, particularly seasoned in this topic, partly because the subject, as you may have noticed, keeps evolving, and I think that's that's a healthy thing. There there are dimensions to this conversation um, that, especially in the last couple of years, have come up that weren't really part of the dialogue. So that's good news. So just as far as what we're doing, um, and I, I wanted to, to kind of introduce that this way, which is to say uh, what we're focused on uh, is driven by a few factors that I'll loosely define as bias. Um, so my personal bias and really my career began in international development and adult learning. It was a 30 year quest to get a grip on practical things to do with empowerment, personal effectiveness, development, change, and well-being. <clears throat> so when I talk about this subject, I tend to balance um, a focus on systemic issues with empowerment and what people can do for themselves. Mm. So that's an important kind of duality. And the conversation can go either way, but I try to find the balance in that. Um, <clears throat> Secondly, in the engineering industry where I work in Canada, um, my view is that minorities are relatively better represented compared to women. So pro proportionally, and this is um, really based on my second bias, is that women are the largest demographic of all minority groups in a sense, and 53% of the university population internationally. And so getting at the gender issue at in MH, what we found is that it can build good organization, good organizational muscle for getting at diversity in general. So when we work at gender, and some people have asked us why are we working on the gender thing, when we work on gender, we know that other minority groups can benefit in the organization, that there are there are transferable things. Um, I would say more recently, uh, the organizational and business upside of diversity has been established. So this is really great. You know, it's apparent, apparent from international research that increased diversity <clears throat> produces enhanced business and organizational results. So that's that's really a, a help to me because I can I can really begin the conversation not from an ideological perspective, but I can begin the conversation by saying this is good for everybody. Uh, what's also compelling, and I think we have seen <clears throat> over the last few years and exacerbated by the pandemic, is that, um, and some of you represent this, is a generation demanding a business commitment to social issues and stepping in where government is unwilling or unable to move forward. So these are, I, I touch on some of these biases and, and um, elements because they've actually provided a kind of momentum to a conversation that, that I think is almost unavoidable. Like, how can you just make like none of this is going on right now? Uh, the events of last summer, um, for example. So just to touch very specifically nitty gritty on what we're doing, we have created a diversity and inclusion uh, council sponsored by the executive team. And we've updated our diversity and inclusion and equity policy and plan. Um, we have uh, a council comprised of a dozen passionate volunteers. And it's interesting when that group gets together, they're not coming from the same place. So there really is a process of um, getting the group comfortable with discomfort because you know that when you've got real diversity and inclusion is when when the conversations are difficult, if everybody's coming from the same place, it's easy. But if you've got real diversity, and if you're really grappling with, with different perspectives, then the going, the going can be a, a challenge for sure. But the, but the diversity council has got quite mature and comfortable with discomfort. That's wonderful. Pelly, thank you so much for sharing all of that. And I appreciate your personal touch that you that you mentioned throughout it of your own biases and um, I thought it was interesting that you acknowledged that um, you know that the the stereotypes that are reflected on you they, that you feel that people will automatically assume you're part of the problem and, and things like that so um, at the end of the day the more that this EDI work 
grows, hopefully less and less of that will continue to exist in is all a collective goal, very interwoven to each other. Well, thank you three so much for, for sharing some of the great initiatives and work that you're all doing. Um, we have a very uh, specific question that I hope you'll all, all answer, which is about what are the biggest challenges you observe when trying to advance equity, diversity, and inclusion in your experiences? So I'll, I'll ask Pelly, then Joanna, then Shane. Pelly, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I think the obvious answer is the existing culture and bias and mm. way of being. Um, you know, we all think that the way we see the world is normal. And of course, it's just one way of thinking and being. So the, 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 the existing culture and bias is a, is a challenge because people are just in it. So, and there's been some good points made, I think, already about how, how to shift people through learning and, and conversations with others where you can get people to um, see different perspectives. The other I would say is, you know, in consulting work, people are quite busy. They're not sitting in their office, they're out and about. And so to find time to, to get people to engage in learning and development and dialogue can be a challenge. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that in the engineering sec sector, I think it really is actually kind of a unique challenge because um, engineering is also a social construct as well as as a technical discipline. And I do know in university that traditionally the focus was not on, on the social side of things. It tended, tended towards the technical. So I think there are wonderful opportunities there to do with group dynamic, organization, culture, social and behavioral theory that really belong in, in uh, engineering schools. And I just loved the earlier point about digging in deep, very early in the education system in the primary levels to to give uh, women and, and diverse students um, uh, the vision and the sense that they actually belong in these disciplines in the first place. Thank you, Pelly. Yeah, I think existing culture and bias, finding time and the traditional focus on the technical, those are three very, very big barriers in engineering, 100%. Joanna, have you found the same thing? Any other additional barriers you've observed? Well, the reason that I founded WIRE was simply because I was always the only female, uh, whether it was on construction site, whether it was in the boardroom, I was always the only female. And uh, not only that, um, you know, I like to use my backyard here in downtown Toronto. We have 117 spoken languages. Where's the diversity and inclusion? You know, and no offense, but this industry is led by white men. You know, I've been asked, why, is, why isn't there a MIRE, men in renewable energy? Well, that's because it's called the industry. And I've had a lot of really awful remarks over the years uh, when I first launched WIRE. Um, I started WIRE in 2012 and then we launched in 2013. And as progressive as the Canadian market is, I had some very offensive remarks stated to me. And I'll give you some examples. I would be at conferences where WIRE would have a booth and people would come up to me stating to me that I'm segregating the industry that's incorrect, I'm bringing it together. Secondly, do I have to wear a wig or a skirt? Very inappropriate. You know, these remarks have been really, have set me off to become even more assertive, assertive but also set me off and became, I became even more determined to make wire even more bigger than it already is. And that's why I started to expand within the Canadian and the international market. And you know, even though we're international, I like to use the word global, be global, act local. We need to be very sensitive to the programs uh, that we do decide to launch in the different countries because you know, North American has a different um, has different issues or obstacles than different women, perhaps in MENA or in Italy or in Europe and so forth. So we work very, very closely with the women in uh, those countries to ensure that we are providing them a platform to make sure that these programs are effective. Um, I think that, you know, it's really, it's unfortunate that we are having these discussions today. They're uncomfortable. However, you know, and I wish that WIRE and other women's organizations didn't have to exist, but they have to exist. So with that being said, I think that, uh, you know, I applaud Shane and Pelly for you joining us because I think it takes a lot of 
champions such as both yourselves to be able to come and have this transparent discussion and be part of the solution. So I really applaud both of you. So thank you. Thank you, Joanna, so much. And I really uh, sincerely appreciate your authenticity here. I think that, you know, when we talk about this existing culture and bias, these, this is what this perpetuates, the type of, frankly, crap that we have to put up with um, and just absolutely, you know, unacceptable behavior and comments that are said uh, is a reality of the things that we go through. So thank you so much for sharing that. Shane, uh, lastly, we'll leave it to you. What, what do you think are some of the barriers you've witnessed in advancing EDI? Uh, thanks. And I'll, I'll try to build and complement on what uh, Pelly and Joanna have shared already. Um, so I'll speak to industry first, and it's certainly it's it's not it's a generalization, but lack of awareness or or understanding or choosing uh, to be unaware. So this complacency mm -hmm. that I've seen in senior leaders, and it's easy to defer to the status quo, um, someone else's problem, right? Until until there's more numbers coming through the university, how can I hire them? When you're the the demand side of the equation. It's <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's an easy deferral, right? Uh, but it is broader. It's societal, as as Pelly alluded to, and whether it's in schools, teachers, parents, at all ages, the universities and industry, of course, as I said, it's really the challenge I see is acknowledging we're all part of it. We're we're all in it together, and uh, really having everyone open to listening first and understanding, and engaging and having all the real voices at the table. It's not a problem that I'm going to solve, that's for certain. It's something I got to learn and help move forward with everyone along the way, right? So with that, I've, I've seen the challenges really right now trying to promote the why and how much mm -hmm. better engineering as a whole would be, including the society we serve um, and getting better answers to problems, as I alluded to earlier. And I would share that I don't believe this is the typical engineering problem that engineers are going to solve. Um, we, we can look for help in other areas, in other groups, in other voices to broaden it uh, beyond the engineering community. Um, so I think there's something there that we need to understand uh, as we want to move forward and bigger and broader. I would say what I've seen in, in very recent times is a lot of amazing work within Manitoba and of course across Canada um, and, and a lot of um, you know, groups smaller on their own, but with some more recent central coordination specifically through Engineer of Juice and just Manitoba, led by Lisa Stepniak here and our provincial government support, has really allowed for a more strategic and open approach to get the voices to the table, to get the right thinking and get all the pieces trying to move together. And I would echo this, this opportunity here today that we continue to try to strengthen our networks across Canada to really make it powerful. Um, because though we're part and active in the 30 by 30, I think it should be 50-50 or diversity across the board if we really want to get somewhere. So I, I, I just uh, will leave it at that. Thank you, Shane. Those were great insights. And uh, I definitely think the I'm very intrigued by the promotion of the why, because I know for people like me, it seems so obvious, but it's, it's a, a fact is that it comes down to, in most of our professions, what is the financial benefit? How, what, where do the numbers fall in? How much do I need to invest? This is the reality of, of a lot of the spaces we're in. Okay, so we've now had a fantastic opportunity to hear from both our senior leader group and our young leader group. So I'm going to actually invite Wendy, Jasmine, and Naomi to come back onto our virtual stage, uh, and we're we're all going to continue the rest of the discussion together. Um, so this this part of the the talk is definitely going to be a little bit different. We're going to be a bit more conversational here. So you might see people, um, the panelists, I'd love them to kind of respond more directly to each other, pretend as if we're, we're all sitting together in a, in a cafe, uh, having a discussion, not on Zoom. <laughs> so while we're getting the other spotlights back on for, for Wendy, Naomi, Joanna, um, and we've got Pelly, Shane, and uh, I think we need Naomi. All right, thank you. Everybody's coming back in, Jasmine. All right, so there was, there's been so many great things said so far, and I've been kind of jotting down some notes as we've been going on. So when we think about some of the challenges that were mentioned earlier on by Naomi, Wendy, and Jasmine, things about 
you know, support required to stay in the profession, reframing the problems we're tackling, the need for role models, learning more about our history and the Indigenous intersection there, being safe and respected, removing unconscious biases. There, there were so many fantastic things that were shared. Um, how do we feel uh, the workplace is able to actually respond to these barriers? Pelly, I see you've lifted your hand up, so let's hear from you first. <laughs> Sorry, I was just itching to say a couple of things, and uh, it's building a little bit off what Wendy said, because she touched on a number of fairly, what I would call nitty gritty things that you can do within an or organization. So there, there are two things that, that uh, I'm doing very specifically within our organization. One is um, the whole sort of big picture kind of education awareness piece is one direction. But Wendy had touched on some really important stuff, which is we've got a lot of levers in the organization to do a systemic um, ways that we go about work. And if your systems are wrong or unconscious, of course, you, you result in systemic bias. So we're doing a bunch of very nitty gritty things to do with measurement, training, um, uh, reviewing benefits programs, um, setting expectations for managers and even goals, pay equity views, staffs surveys. So you kind of get the drift here, right? There's a bunch of very tangible things you can do in an organization and it, it creates a management system and measurement for progress. So you can actually say what you're gonna do, set some goals, get people aligned on it, hold them accountable and, and watch the bar raise over time. So I just wanted to touch on that and thank Wendy for, for raising that sort of category of things we can do. Thank you, Pelly. Wendy, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I think uh, I really agree with that approach. You're being more like system, systemic than, than just focusing on one individual or one specific situation. I think it's super important. And ultimately, it's the leadership. It's really dependent on the leadership. If the leadership says, okay, equity, diversity, inclusion is important for us, we're going to put in place those different measures. That's when things change, that there, that's when there is a cultural change. So I think it's really important to, to also think about how the leadership is an example to other employees. And when we say we go in that direction, the rest will follow. Yeah. Yes, Joanna. So one of the things that, uh, Wendy, what I like what you talked about was, you know, that women don't necessarily go and apply to jobs unless they meet all their criteria or all the requirements. Mm -hmm. I've always uh, been instrumental in discussing and educating women and all. Do not box yourself in. I applied to jobs that I had no business applying after university. However, I applied and applied and applied. And if I would not have applied, I would not be where I am today. Mm -hmm. I've never checked my, those boxes and I never will. So, you know, I really applaud uh, that you actually talked about that. Another thing that we at WIRE do, uh, we are huge ambassadors of the Electricity Human Resources Canada Leadership on Accord on Gender Diversity. If you haven't signed up, I encourage each and sing, every single one of you on, uh, the, on, corporate, on the corporations uh, to sign off on this accord. Uh, it is a public commitment uh, to by Canadian employers, uh, educators, unions, associations, and governments promote workforce diversity within their organizations. And we are huge ambassadors and we continue to promote EHRC and the amazing work that they do. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I know like, for instance, Naomi and Jasmine brought up a lot of really interesting topics related to how race intersects with these conversations. Uh, Shane, I know you've mentioned a, a variety of things. Do you feel like your organization has been able to learn in the last year from all these massive race conversations to be able to really integrate some of this into the day-to-day? -day? Uh, certainly, yes. I, I would say just based on our history um, as a Crown Corporation and developing resources over the past hundred years and the uh, impacts and tragedies on Indigenous lands over those decades, it's something that we have acknowledged. So it's not a new conversation for us and working actively with uh, with the communities and partnerships of late have been very uh, powerful, but lots of work to be done there. So I think it does reflect and reinforces how real this is and, and how relevant it is. So I, I would suggest to your question, absolutely, Vanessa, and as uh, Pelly uh, stated and Vanessa, uh, sorry, and Wendy and Joanne both uh, expanded on, 
Um, leadership needs to engage it, acknowledge it, to allow it to, uh, of course, take place with, with all the participation of the likes of the people here today, but they also have to take action. Mm -hmm. So it's putting it into motion and action and uh, being, being a large employer internally, we're able to look at these things, of course, as, as per your question, but then it's also being brave enough to be a leader and challenging others in industry uh, as to where they're at and what they're doing and, and what they're going to do to step up, right? So it's broadening it to beyond just uh, acknowledging. A hundred percent. And I think it was mentioned earlier um, about the evolution in, in this space and how it's it's not just we identified 10 issues a few years ago, we're just steadily working on those. There's new things that are constantly coming up that the conversations are evolving. So uh, a question to the young leaders I would have is I've heard feedback from other senior leaders that it's difficult to keep up. It's difficult to understand where the focus should be. And if there's so many things to talk about, how, how do you know what not to talk about? How are you not just constantly working on all these initiatives 24 um, seven? So I'm curious what, how, what you three think on, on that concept of how do you, how do the senior leaders stay connected with the young leaders with this constant evolution of conversation? Any anything come to mind? Wendy, yeah. Yeah, well, I think it's important to create the spaces to have that dialogue first. Like you need to have, for example, I don't know, a quarterly meeting with uh, young leaders and have that space for them to really talk with you and tell them like, what are the main issues right now? What are things that can be improved within the company in the processes? If you don't have that platform that is really integrated into your process, then it might not happen naturally because people won't necessarily think they can talk to you about it. That's the other thing too. You have to remember that as a senior leader, like it is intimidating for young leaders to approach 100%. you. But if, if you create that space for them, then it's going to make it easier for you to have that dialogue and work on things that are important to them as well. A hundred percent. And things like these reverse mentorship programs that exist and they, they seem uh, like really great opportunities. Naomi, I saw you unmuted. Did you have any feedback as well? Yeah, definitely. I would say um, investing in groups that are already doing the work as well mm. is really important. Um, I think that oftentimes we see these problems and then immediately think, how can I find a solution? But the reality is there's a lot of people that have been working on it for a long time already, and maybe investing some money and um, true commitment into those groups will actually um, create the real uh, long-term change that um, we're all uh, striving for. So definitely like there's groups like NG Queers, there's groups like Nesby, there's so many higher up organizations that have been um, challenging the issues that currently exist and have been speaking about um, practical solutions for a very long time. Um, so addressing them, but then also coming with a structured plan um, that is sophisticated as in they're taking the issue with like a high level of seriousness as well um, can create a very long lasting change. A hundred percent. Yeah. There's no need to recreate the wheel here. There's already a lot of great concepts out there. Jasmine, what about you? Um, yeah, I think exactly like Naomi said, you know, you don't have to be the expert on everything. I could never be the expert on what it's like to be a black person in engineering, but there's someone like Naomi who's done this amazing work. So I think if you can focus on elevating those voices and within your own team, kind of look around at who's around you and your team and Hopefully, uh, depending on your hiring and retention practices, there'll be some people there who have unique and interesting stories to tell. And within your team, you can work on creating a safe space where they can tell those stories and you can learn from them if they're comfortable sharing. Um, and it doesn't have to be a, a big, massive step. It can just be, hey, I was reading this um, article or I heard this podcast or I read this book. Um, let's talk about this or, hey, I'm recommending this or let's take a few minutes for this values moment. So if you can kind of build that into everything you do in those small manageable steps, um, it's a lot more meaningful and um, personal and applied and relevant than maybe like a huge, a huge initiative that's so overwhelming to take on. A hundred percent. And with all these different tactics and concepts, Shane, there's something you said earlier really stuck with me about those um, existing cultures and biases that exist. So how, what have you found has been successful to actually dismantle these individuals who are potentially in positions of power from really shifting their thinking and, and getting them to engage in these different groups and conversations in different ways? What, is, what has worked? 
Well, fortunately, within our organization, we have a lot of uh, amazing young leaders who have been engaged on their own. So similar to what others have shared, it's bringing them together uh, and letting them share their perspectives and voices. Uh, you know, we've actually uh, you know, started unconscious bias training for employees, you know, awareness, cultural awareness pieces. So people are getting education. So, mm-hmm. so they can come from a piece to, to let their guards down and have open conversations on on tough topics at times. So, I mean, internally, we're, we're, we're looking at those pieces and building on what may have been okay in the past, but get better at as we move, move forward. Um, within industry, just because of my role, I'm able to challenge colleagues on these topics. And it's probably still more of those uh, conversations that uh, they you know, they, they may not normally look to engage upon. Um, so there it's still, I'm going to suggest uh, trying to even acknowledge the, the problem. And it, it's not necessarily a negative perspective. It's really helping them understand that we need your help. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and generally people, when they understand it that way, um, moving them to action becomes that much easier once, once they're uh, truly listening and hearing the powerful vo- voices from those uh, like we're hearing today. Um, and then you start seeing positive progress and change happen. Hundred percent. No, I love that, and I think that that just in general, the concept of calling people into the conversation, bringing them engaged, and and even uh, you know, I, I think it was really profound what Pelly said earlier. I, I think that that is the root of why there's resistance to some to some of this stuff is individual people. It all comes down to their experience, right? And if they're feeling like. I, as a a white man of privilege in a power position, no longer have space for myself, then why are they going to be engaged to, to in these conversations to make change? And that adds some frustration sometimes, because it's like, why, why do I need to make sure you're perfectly comfortable in this journey when, when maybe your comfort has been the problem? So it's, it's a very cyclical challenge there. And uh, I'm curious, Pelle, I see you've unmuted any thoughts on that. Um, well, I do think there is this balance of, just to say again, the balance of the learning, which I've been hearing about, and, and elevating the voices. Love that phrase. Um, so there is the learning and broadening people's minds, um, an open mindset, so to speak. And then I do think that the management system piece is important. So we really are reinforcing our, our change ideas. Uh, we're, we're setting expectations for people. We're looking where we can change and measure things. Because if, you know, you're engineers, many of you, you know what entropy is. If you don't, if you don't have an active reinforcement leadership um, plan and hold people uh, accountable, um, then it's going to go in some other direction. Mm-hmm. I think the good news is these days... Um, you know, it's kind of interesting because our, our 23 offices are spread across North America. And I, as I was listening to Jasmine talk a little bit about her experience, which is the part of the world I grew up in, it's a different conversation there from Atlanta or Portland. And so uh, although I don't, I don't give people the out, Vanessa, when they say it's complex and there are so many different things, what do we go at? Give me a break. I don't think that that we can we can excuse ourselves because these are hard <laughs> issues that get represented in different ways. But the the thing I found is we've got quite a bit of diversity around us. And if you just tap into it and give people the space to speak their experiences, and if other people will listen, which is something you can reinforce in an organization, there's learning that goes on, and then you're suddenly appreciative of, oh. I just hadn't thought about what it would be like. Um, And I will say, just to be encouraging, although we're an employee-owned consulting engineering firm with a long history in Canada, um, I don't find the organization as full of dinosaurs. I find the organization as full of a lot of people who want a little bit of help and guidance on how to get at this. They're really Mm -hmm. hearing it enough in the news uh, they may be married, uh, they may have children. And I think we're all getting exposed to a bunch of stuff. People are really looking for, well, what can I do? How can I do? Or can, where, how can I link arms with people and get on with some stuff? So I'm finding that there's a decent momentum to get at this stuff. Well, that's very encouraging. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're feeling that. 
As we're nearing the end, I want to give each of our six panelists an opportunity to get, share their kind of closing thoughts from the, from the great discussion we've had here. Um, a prompt could be, do you know, what do you think it's really going to take for all these diverse peoples to feel welcome and accepted, able to succeed in engineering? But in general, I, I want to keep it open-ended. Whatever you feel is a, is a closing remark you'd like to make. So I'm going to popcorn style it. Let's start with Naomi. What do you think? What are your closing thoughts? Sure. One of the last things I wanted to mention was um, my appreciation of Joanna's honesty. I think that that really ties into the accountability part. Um, of course, we can talk about diversity and inclusivity, but if nobody's being accountable for actions that are just completely inappropriate or uncalled for, we won't really have the change. Um, and there's definitely been too many instances where I've observed that or felt that myself within the spaces that I'm in. Uh, so I would really hope to see more um, actual listening to those types of issues. And then also understanding that as we have these conversations, you will be challenged if you do have a certain type of privilege, if you do have a certain type of power to have change, that privilege and power can't remain the same. And I think that's a lot of times where the um, uncomfortable, uh, where it's, it lies because it's everything is a great conversation until like you have to reflect on what you've done and mm -hmm. how you can change and actually uh, be of a uh, good benefit to others and give them the same type of um, access and same types of opportunities that you've uh, so easily been able to um, have within your own um, journey. So I think, yeah, that's mostly what I would say is that um, as I go through my own experiences, I would love to be um, affirmed and believed in what I've encountered and have uh, solutions that really address those issues uh, without having to sugarcoat it or without having to uh, ba take baby steps so that it's easier, um, even though there's specific um, groups that are suffering a lot more than mm -hmm. others. 100% that accountability is so, so important. Thank you, Naomi. Joanna, what are your closing thoughts and statements? Well, I want to thank all of you, uh, not only on the panel, um, Vanessa, you've done a great job moderating. I want to thank uh, the audience because together we are making a difference, because together we are having these conversations, and only together will we change this. Um, I applaud every single person on this panel as well for sharing and being truthful. Uh, again, I know that this is awkward at times, but these are awkward discussions that must be had. Mm. Um, one last thing I will always say to every single one of you is that WIRE is here to support and assist in any way. If there's anything that I can do personally, reach out to me. I am always open for discussion and dialogue. Do not ever hesitate. And again, a big applause to all of you. So thank you. Thank you so much, Joanna. That was very well put. Wendy, what are your closing thoughts? Yes, I also want to thank everyone on the panel and the participants that are here listening to these conversations. I think just by being here, it shows that there's a real interest from the industry and the profession in general. So it's important to keep having these discussions, not only in these spaces, but also when you go back to work or to school and keep going and really showcase all the different perspectives that, that there is and that are underrepresented and not being afraid to speak up when something mm -hmm. happens and not being afraid to take your place because personally as a woman too sometimes I've been in situations where uh, people told me things that I wasn't comfortable with but you have to stand up for yourself and for others when you can I think that's super important and also another thing again it's if we're able to reframe how we view engineering and really how the profession can impact this, our society, then we're gonna be able to attract more people. And just when we do that, besides attracting people, we need to make sure that we're able to have this, this safe place for them where they feel, where they can be themselves without being judged and they're respected by their peers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Wendy. I love that sentiment of respect. Pelly, your closing thoughts for the day? Well, um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to leave with um, <clears throat> more questions and answers, I think, because it's, it's you know, I'm sort of privileged to be with this group because I feel like I may come away with some things that I hadn't thought of before. Um, a, a couple of sentiments, I think one is to be encouraging people in general to take time for this subject. It's, um, you know, we're busy folk and, and um, 
we all have lists. So I think just taking the time out. Um, I think that the door has been opened on a bunch of things. And really the question is, what are we gonna do with it? Mm -hmm. And then um, lastly, I'd give, give you all the same advice and it's probably gratuitous for this crowd because you're pretty engaged, but I will give you the same thought that I would give my own family, my own daughters, which is don't you dare take the, the small progress that we've made for granted. This is not something that will exist unless we champion it and breathe life into it and take a stand for it. So those are a couple of, couple of ideas. Thank you, Pelly. We'll definitely keep fighting the good fight for sure. Shane, your closing thoughts for the day? Uh, thank you. Um, I guess just from an industry perspective, I was going to share a quick concept that uh, though I, I shared we're large and we're doing some things, uh, we've been openly sharing best practices in industry uh, and, and one voice within a small business that can quickly influence or impact other organizations and, and it becomes viral learning from, from each other. And ultimately, um, for those who are still uh, you know, maybe challenged to understand the why, it, it ultimately is for better business results. So it's an argument I use regardless. Mm -hmm. And uh, overall, I, I would say uh, this change is happening. Um, so it's so inspiring to, to hear from you all because at most of these events or all of them, I, I learn way more than I share. So I thank you all for that, uh, including uh, the audience. And uh, I encourage everyone to do something and continue to be part of this. So thank you. Thank you so much, Shane. I love that. And Jasmine, we'll end off with you. Final remarks of the day. Yeah, well, thanks everyone. Learned a lot from listening to everyone and thanks to the audience. And Vanessa, you're a super awesome moderator. I love it. You did a great job. Um, if I could um, kind of put one idea into the heads of all the Canadian engineers. The idea would be that these are engineering issues. You know, often we think, oh, this is something for HR. This is something for for someone else. Um, and this is this is for us. And as engineers, we form the fabric of society. We're designing our society and the direction we're going to go. And it's in our hands to make it better. And these issues, you know, indigenous issues are engineering issues. We're working on indigenous land and we need to respect that and think about what that means. Um, so we're, we're really in an awesome, awesome position to make a huge difference. And I think I would just tell everyone to reflect on that and think about this is, this is part of your job as an engineer. This isn't a, another department, this is for you. And um, as we have people taking individual personal responsibility for these things, educating themselves and holding themselves and each other accountable, being willing to have super uncomfortable, super awkward conversations and put yourself out there. Um, that discomfort is the only way we're going to, to move forward together. So thank you all. Thank you, Jasmine. That was beautifully, beautifully put. Thank you for all that. And to all six of you, I really appreciate all the time that you spent. I know you're all very phenomenal leaders in your own spaces and, and all the work that you're doing. So we really sincerely appreciate your time. Um, and I know for me, I would like to definitely leave with the closing sentiment of I, I kind of am fallen between the middle of these two bodies. I graduated university, but I'm two weeks away from applying to my PN. So I know that I am looking forward in the profession to having this continued sentiment of listening to the young voices and having uh, senior leaders continue to challenge themselves and, and the sentiment of discomfort through the growth. And that I hope that in time that more people like me who fall under multiple intersections of identities will continue to be able to thrive in STEM. So thank you so much to Engineers Canada for hosting us all today. I'll pass it back to Gerard for uh, final statements. Gerard, you potentially on mute. I was saying all kinds of interesting stuff there. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. Thanks, Vanessa. What a, a, a really awe-inspiring discussion. I got a great deal out of that. I want to thank uh, Jasmine, Joanna, Naomi, 
Pelly, Shane, Wendy, uh, and of course uh, you, Vanessa, um, uh, for for a really interesting, thought provoking uh, presentation today. I think we we've got a lot of takeaways for all of us. Um, I'm sad to say, but this this brings to a, a close a busy month of the 30 by 30 sessions. Over the past four sessions, we've heard from champions who are working on making tangible changes to improve the collection of data on diversity and inclusion, systematic changes to engineering education and professional development of engineers. And today, we've learned so much from everyone on the panel. This is an ongoing discussion and Engineers Canada is committed to maintaining the kind of knowledge sharing and building momentum to reach our collective goals of 30 by 30 and broader uh, inclusion in engineering. Thank you, and we hope you have a great rest of the day. Uh, I really appreciate you all being here, and uh, we hope to hear from you again soon. Have a good rest of the day, everybody. Thanks so much, Gerard. Thank you, everybody.